Space Coast Progressive Alliance. It is so good to see all of you. I know these have been very, very trying times. Uh, there were so many people uh, that have had so much pain. You know, when, when we knew these storms were coming, we knew it was going to be tough. Uh, when you turn on the television and you see poor people in places like Dominica, uh, Culebra, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, the islands on the north side of Cuba, which nobody seems to be talking about, the Keys, up and down the peninsula of Florida, and then a major earthquake in Mexico. You know, I mean, it's like, come on, okay, how bad can it get? And then fires break out in California. Uh, you know, it's just like, you know, one thing after another. Friends of ours that are sitting in water at home, literally homes that are they're flooded, folks that have major damage, folks that have minor damage. There is no one in this room that in one way or another has not been impacted by what's been going on. So this is a reminder that we are in this together. When some people like to sit at home and say, oh, you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, or you have to stand by yourself and not expect handouts from the government. Hey, I'll tell you what, just wait until it's your turn. Just wait until it's your turn. Because we are all in this together. Empathy, I believe, is a hallmark of a liberal or a progressive mind. The ability to look into someone else's eyes and to imagine yourself in their position is something that I think is, is a great strength, this great ability to reach out and help other people that need your help. It's amazing. We'll be talking more about that as the night goes on, but I know that many of you are hurting, and I know that you came here tonight because this is going to be a special night, a chance to hear some real interesting folks talk, a chance for us to realize that we are all in this together. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. I'd like to... Uh, First of all, welcome uh, our speakers this evening. I'd like to welcome all of you as well. Uh, I want to make a special thanks to the folks who put our meetings on. We have an action projects committee, uh, which has a whole team of planners and people that are all volunteers who work very, very hard to make this work. And tonight, uh, I'd like to make a special thanks to Vicki Impoco, who helped really focus uh, a lot of this work tonight. <laughs> to, uh, Bonnie Ida. Bonnie is here somewhere. I know Bonnie. She was in the back, but so. Bonnie Ida and Barbara Bingham. Barbara's Barbara. There you go, Barbara. Thank you so much for all the work that you do for us in making this happen tonight. Um, ordinarily, we announce at this point a, an action item, something that we're going to ask you to do before uh, the day is done or some, over the next couple of days. Um, what we've done is we've left our action item tonight open. Uh, we're going to see what we're going to be talking about, and we're, I think by the time the meeting is done, we'll all probably know something that we can do to make a difference on the issues that we're talking about and about perhaps uh, the uh, you know, horrible weather or the things that have been going on. But you'll have some kind of action item to, to take with you when you leave tonight. Um, Hey, one of the things we are working on, the Space Coast Progressive Alliance, is we're working with some folks at the O'Galley Arts District to do a mural, a progressive mural uh, for our community. Now, we're asking people to submit ideas. We've been asking for this for a little while. We'd like to remind you, the deadline's approaching. We have a small committee of folks who've been working on this. Bonnie Ida is the contact person for that. So when Bonnie comes, if anybody wants to submit an idea or they want to ask what's going on or know more about it, I'm going to connect you with Bonnie when she comes in. Uh, and also, this is about the time of the year when we start looking for volunteers who would like to serve on our board. Uh, in 2018, we'll be looking for some new members on our board and perhaps a couple of new officers. Uh, frankly, if anybody would, would really like to get up front and do this and be a president, man, I'll tell you what, I am so thrilled to chat with you. So if there's anybody here in the room that would like to serve uh, in a leadership position with the SEPA, please, please, we need your help. We always need help, uh, always need volunteers because we have so much going on. This, by the way, is Bonnie Ida. Bonnie, raise your hand. We were talking about you while you were gone. She'll also be serving as our timer tonight. Uh, she will be keep making sure that everybody stays on time so that we can all leave here uh, at a reasonable hour. So thank you for all that you do, Bonnie. And I was telling you about her, so please don't tell her what I said, okay? Thank you. They'll be watching you. That little stop sign, you'll notice it's not to, not to help kids cross the street. Um, 
In the future, uh, sometimes we, we have trouble with parking. It doesn't look like it's going to be an issue for us tonight, uh, but uh, sometimes parking can be an issue when we have a full house. If in the future you're coming to one of our meetings, consider carpooling because sometimes these parking spaces fill up. But we do have extra parking behind the building. Uh, if, if you're ever out here trying to find a parking spot, don't forget you can always park in the back. Now our Vice President, Candy Green, would like to say a couple words to you. Candy, our Vice President. Hi. I know everyone's been hit up for everything lately, but we as an organization have tried to be as generous as we can be lately. Our funds are getting a little low, and I always ask you if you can help us pay for this room by donating. But this, this last period of time, we've donated the generator. We're part of the group that just donated the two generators to Puerto Rico. And we try, to respond. we try to respond as best we can in the limited funds and limited people that we have. So anything that you can give in here tonight will help us. With, the, with just running this room or any of the other things we're asked to do. So I know I'm always asking you, but I'm really asking you tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we always hate begging for money. It's, it's a, a funny thing. We also do have a legal defense fund. We're trying uh, very hard to help uh, folks that, that uh, potentially may not have enough money to get legal assistance. I've got a couple different things that we're working on. And by the way, the job costs, where are they? They are. Right here, uh, Alan and Pat Jotkoff, they are heroes of our community. Uh, they are coordinating the fund, fundraising collection dispersal with that money going to the islands. Uh, and we thank you for that. You guys have always done so much for our community. Thank you for that. Um, we always like to uh, set aside uh, a little bit of time at the beginning of all of our meetings for our affiliated groups, local uh, folks that have something to say. We give everybody a, a chance to take uh, three minutes. We don't have the list. Hey, Linda, could you bring up the, the uh, speaker list, please? So if you have something you'd like to say, if you haven't gotten on the list, please raise your hand. We'll get you on the list. Make sure that you've got, I see Pat's got something. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. That, we got you on the list. Okay. Our first speaker tonight is Julie Turner. She's going to be speaking for the Sierra Club. She'll be followed by Barbara Bingdeer from the Veggie Table. And then Jose is here. I know Jose's here. Yes, talk about me coordinating for our friends down on the islands. Uh, Jose Luis Rivera is a good man, and he has been really spirating that, putting, spending a lot of time. But first, Julie Turner, welcome aboard. Three Hi there, I'm from the Turtle Coast Sierra Club, and I'm here to announce our next meeting, which is on the fourth Thursday of the month, which is October 26th. Um, this month we are going to be talking about sustainability, 100% sustainability. We have uh, Phil Compton, who's the lead staff for Sierra Club, ready for 100% clean energy for all of Florida. He will talk about how the Space Coast can lead the way in meeting this century's toughest challenges to uh, become a safe and secure place to live. Um, we meet at the Friendship Fellowship at Pineda, and at the time is seven. At 6.30 we have uh, light refreshments and social time. So I hope to see some of you there. Light refreshments. <laughs> In other words, you get to eat LED lights or light bulbs. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. For Thank you so much, Julie. I tell you what, sustainability is becoming a word of the hour. Uh, I want to thank all of you that came over to the Melbourne City Hall. Remember, we went over there to, to uh, harass them a little bit, encourage them to form their own sustainability committee. Uh, but this is going on, and this is the sunshine state for crying out loud. Why aren't we doing more to promote solar power? Uh, domestic solar hot water systems, uh, efficient, efficient energy systems for our buildings. It's such a great idea. Thank you, Julie, for that. Um, Barbara Bigner from the Veggie Table. Barbara is the co-chair of our Action Projects Committee, by the way. Come on in. Thank you, Barbara. Sure. I think I saw most of you walk past, and are, you're aware that I have a Veggie Table back there. And I thank you for your interest and for stopping by. I have some new uh, literature. Of course, the one that everybody says is, where do you get your protein? So I have a sheet that 
list where where you can get protein and actually there's other places you can get protein too but this is a good start and also I have some of you may remember community harvest from downtown O'Galley yeah. I have the original <coughs> cookbook put, uh, which was done by Susan Rizzo and Sue Thompson I am offering it for five dollars which will be a donation to go to the Space Coast Progressive Alliance so uh, Oh, <laughs> yay! Thank you so much. Finally, I like to um, kind of coordinate my table with what I have to say and the program of the evening. And so this is what I want, when it's the environment or if it's your health, that was easy. So for tonight, I, I kind of put this together to say that I am I've been, uh, I'm proud, <laughs> I, have, I am, have pride in saying that I've been vegan for 30 years, and if you need information on transitioning to a vegan diet, it's back at my table. <laughs> Jose Luis Rivera. Speaking on behalf of Puerto Rican Relief, he's also a board member on the SCPA. Thank you to Phil and the board. I'm also president of the Puerto Rican Initiative in Action, Iniciativa Acción Puerto Ricana in Spanish. And what we tried to do here worked very well. We were able to get donations dropped off at different establishments and organizations, including the Palm Bay Chamber of Commerce, Melbourne Chamber of Commerce, Coconuts on the Beach, several restaurants, Brevard Dems, and what I can tell you very proudly was that a lot of progressives and Democrats just showed up. I had never met them before. New faces that we're just finding out through the social media network, including uh, Speak Out Brevard, Space Coast Progressive Alliance, and Brevard Dems, and a few other organizations that were very supportive of this effort. So we're able to send a full truck, uh, half a container full first, and then this last Tuesday, a 52 container over to Orlando. That organization there unites 12 Puerto Rican organizations called United for Puerto Rico, or CASA, like house in Spanish. And they work with the office of the First Lady, who in turn works together with the Puerto Rican Federal Affairs Office in Washington and Orlando, that in turn works with FEMA. So that's how we get the logistics of it all down there. But we're stopping collections for now because FEMA's overloaded in their process of bringing them down and, and distributing them. So for now, we're very grateful. If you'd like to donate any of the most credible organizations like United for Puerto Rico, again, with the Office of the First Lady, you're welcome to do that. Uh, we're able to send things to now. My son was telling me women are taking over the world and they're doing great. <laughs> now was the organization that pulled together all the funds for the generators that were sent to Culebra Island to which uh, this organization contributed, Space Coast Progressive Alliance, and Phil personally with his wife. And um, we had now, we had Brevard Dems, and Speak Up Brevard, and the Jatkov family. Yes. And the Islamic, Jatkovs, and the Islamic Society of Brevard, or Brevard Islamic Society. So that was very good, thanks, thanks to you all. And just so you know, Puerto Rico's economy and infrastructure is not in bad condition because the Puerto Ricans are not smart or lazy is because they receive 60% of Medicare funds, even though they pay 100% of Medicare funds like any other American, but we only get 60%. The same applies to infrastructure roads and bridges and everything. We receive normally 60 or to 50% of the funding a regular state we receive because we're a territory. So if you go to Puerto Rico, you cannot vote for the president. You're American, I am too, and everybody else on there is. You can vote for your president, you can vote for your congressman. But here, we can pressure congressmen, and we ask you to please do, to continue to support the uh, recuperation in Puerto Rico. Thanks to you all. MJ Waters is going to talk about the Indian River Lagoon, followed by Tony Tutton. So it's Sustainability Month, apparently. Um, the Indian River Lagoon Coalition and Florida Tech are partnering and we're going to do a series of three programs over the next year. And the first one is next week on Thursday night and it's called Why Sustainability? And Florida Tech um, Research Institute is going to talk about sustainability in local governments of East Florida. 
So we have a lot of members of our group that are working with Melbourne, Palm Bay, and now COCO, all to start sustainability boards. So this is an effort to support those people and to give them tips and tactics that they can use to establish those boards. You're probably familiar with Suntree and what they've been doing. So it's things like community gardens, um, solar, electric, your homes at a discount. Um, they're building a solar-powered hotel in Satellite Beach, but it's all the local control. So we need folks like you to find out about the sports in your hometown and join them and get on them because we need progressives involved. Also, Courtney Barker from Satellite Beach is going to be there talking about how to implement a local sustainability program. So this will be held at Gleason Auditorium at Florida Tech next Thursday at 6.30 p.m. and it's free of charge. You can find, it's all over Facebook. If you come to the Lagoon Coalition page or the Progressives page, you'll see it advertised there. And I have some little flyers like this on the back table if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thanks, Next up, Tony Dutton from the League of Women Voters. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> a key issue this year in Florida is restoration of voting rights for nonviolent felons. In Florida, if you're ever convicted of felony, even something minor like trespassing on a posted construction site or a, or a, a citrus grove, or if you're a young person who got involved in having or selling or using marijuana, you may be a, convicted of a felon. And Florida is one of three states in the union where forget about voting for the rest of your life if you're so convicted, even after you've served your sentence, paid any fine, served any parole, all of that. <clears throat> so this year, the League of Women Voters and a number of other organizations are trying to get petitions signed to put the issue on the ballot in 2018 so that the voters of Florida, signing a petition doesn't say you're necessarily for it, it only says, yes, I'll put it on the ballot so the voters can decide whether they want to approve it or not and we're trying to get petitions signed, and there are a number of them at the back table there. And in the meantime, the League of Women Voters, Friday a week on the 20th of October, is having what we call a timely topic, which will be a luncheon at the um, <clears throat> Indian River Colony Club at noon, where the issue will be discussed by someone who's worked on it, a civil rights lawyer who's worked on the issue, and a number of felons who have been convicted and now are left out of the state for the rest of their lives, one of whom will happen to be a, happens to be a lawyer. So uh, we want to urge people to come to that and to please sign a petition if you can, and thank you very much. I am so glad that we have a League of Women Voters. I think everybody in this room appreciates the value of this organization to our community and to our nation. Uh, Tony is an amazing guy, I tell you what, he is, he's done so much for our community, but uh, thank you Tony and Mar, thanks to the League. We have uh, actually a number of different uh, petitions in the back. If you haven't thought of signing any of these petitions, please consider it. Well, there's one for cannabis, there's one for uh, restoring uh, rights to felons, uh, there's another one I believe, but anyway, take a look at the petitions that are in the back. Uh, but. And we're very thankful to have the League of Women Voters uh, as an ally. Uh, our next speaker is Pat Jodkoff. She's going to be talking uh, about Anna Eskamani, a candidate uh, for office. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, next Tuesday at my home, we'll be hosting a fundraiser for Anna Eskamani um, from 6 to 8. If you'd like to come meet her, whatever you can afford to give her, she could use. We definitely need to have her in our House of Representatives in Florida because clearly we don't have the representation we need. So please join us, whatever, whoever can come. Thank you. Thanks once again to uh, Pat and Alan for their hard work on our community. I mean, they are always, when somebody's in need, there's some kind of project or somebody's raising money or somebody's in trouble, somehow or another, Pat and Alan seem to always find out find find themselves a way to help they show up and, and help and I am forever thankful for that you've been great supporters of our community uh, in so many ways uh, I know that Randy Foster who uh, is an amazing guy used to be on the SCPA board uh, he was a, a former candidate for county board uh, I know Randy wanted to be here tonight uh, but I'll tell you what 
we were talking about Anna running for office. Well, keep an eye out for Randy Foster's name because he's about to make a big announcement. So something to think about. If you like Randy Foster, uh, you're going to really like what he has to say. Um, well, you know what? It's about time for us to get down to business. Um, I'd like to very quickly do a quick introduction uh, of each, just each of our, our uh, uh, speakers tonight. Yes? I signed up. Oh, I'm, I'm, if I missed you, please come on up. Come on up. John Davis? I gotcha. John Davis, Green Party. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. How did I do that? John, welcome aboard. I'm sorry. Forgive me, buddy. No, no problem. Uh, I'm John Davis. I'm an old organizer along the Treasure Coast. Um, we organized the Treasure Coast Progressive Alliance down south. I, I served there for three years as the president until I moved out of the area a couple of years ago. And now I, I live up in Jacksonville. Now I'm an organizer for the Green Party, uh, state organizer for the Green Party. And we are in the area trying to start local affiliates. We just started one. St. Lucie County now has a Green Party affiliate. North here, Volusia County now has a Green Party affiliate. So we're now working on Indian River County and Bavar County. Um, we have meetings. There's flyers back there before you go if you're interested. There's flyers back there on the table. We're having meetings on the 24th in Indian River County, and we're having meetings here in Bavar County on the 25th and 26th. The 25th, one's in Melbourne and the other one's in Cocoa. Uh, so if you're interested in joining the Green Party, um, if there's any Green Party people, registered Green Party people in here now that want to sign up, I can sign you right up and you can be one of the first people. Indian River County, we, we already just about got that nailed down. I, uh, door knocked all weekend, last weekend we got nine, we need ten, I got five promises. So Indian River County is just about done, they're going to have a Green Party down. I'm starting up here in Bavard. I got one, whoever wants to start, else wants to join the Green Party up here, be one of the first, let me know. Uh, sign you up if you're interested just want to come out and see what we're about the meetings are um, the flyers are on the back on the table pick up a flyer and come on out and see what we're about we're the only progressive party in the u.s thank you thank you john i apologize for missing your name on the list oh my but thank you again yeah i'll tell you what our allies uh at in Indian River County. We always appreciate that, our sister organization. Um, hey, let's get back to business. Um, we have five wonderful speakers. Uh, starting from my left, we have Dr. Sue Kiley. She's the Director of Programs for the Women's Center. Can I ask you a round of applause for, for uh, Dr. Kiley? To her left is Bob Gavorty. He's the Executive Editor for Florida Today and FloridaToday.com. To his left, Gina Lee Duncan, and she's the uh, Transgender Inclusiveness Director for Equality for Florida, e Equality Florida, and the Chair of Trans Action Florida. Talk about a busy person. <laughs> Gina. To her left, Peregrine Hayward, a senior at Satellite High School, and talk about busy. Senior at Satellite High. Let's hear it for Peregrine. And to her left, Michael Bloom, who's the chair of the LGBTQ Child Welfare Working Group and Lake Brevard. So, Michael. <laughs> now, we titled our program tonight, Pride and Prejudice in Brevard. And this is very interesting. It's an interesting story, uh, and it was really sparked by uh, an editorial. Uh, you know, the women's, the women's center is uh, every year has a really neat fundraising event. And I know it was interrupted by the hurricane. I think you're going to have it tomorrow, tomorrow night. Right, tomorrow night. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. It's a chance to raise some money for an organization that helps people that are desperate for help. Uh, the Women's Center is, is special. Um, you know, I'll tell you what, I have four sisters, and I know that. At least one of them has gotten uh, amazing help, not here in Brevard, but in her, at a women's center up in Northwest Indiana. And honestly, uh, these people are there when you need them. And talk about, you know, we talk about the job costs always being there. The things that the women's center sees on a daily basis, you know, abuse, I don't even need to go into it. The reality is, all I can tell you is thank you so much for what you do. Um, but anyway, so 
so they're having this fundraiser, and one of the things is a, a, an opportunity to raise money by encouraging local uh, community leaders to uh, to come and drag, uh, gentlemen in drag anyway, but to people to dress up and, and to come on in and entertain everyone. And Bob wrote an editorial, Bob Cabordi wrote an editorial in the paper because he's one of the guys who was willing to go uh, and participate and help in this fundraiser. And uh, he, he said a couple things that, that frankly, folks kind of took offense to. And, and Gina uh, basically responded and said, hey, you know what, some of the things you said, I'm gonna, gonna challenge you on. And I'm just curious, by the way, how many people here, how many people in this room have ever written, ever written a letter to the editor? Okay, that's good to see. Because I tell you what, if you haven't, you should. Because let's face it, uh, expressing your ideas, expressing your opinions, uh, challenging things that are, are written uh, or, or said in the, on the media uh, is really your civic responsibility. So if you see something you don't agree with, write a letter to the editor, you know? And, and you never know, it might get published and, and you know, you might get a chance to come and talk at, a, at an event like this. But this is, what happened is then Bob responded and said, you know, this is an opportunity for us to have a community discussion on these topics. LGBT issues uh, specifically need to be addressed because there are too many people that aren't addressing them. And we have some very, very, very serious things that are happening. There are states that are passing, we'll call them bathroom laws. Uh, there are states that are passing laws restricting or allowing uh, wedding bakery, wedding cake bakeries to, to, to say who they can bake a cake for and who they can't. Uh, we have the President of the United States who is, is denying uh, the opportunity to serve our country based on somebody's uh, preferences. And I, it just makes you crazy to see some of the things that are happening. We all know that there is bullying, there is abuse, uh, harassment, and there has been for a long, long time. And for too often, this has been hidden in the shadows. People have turned the other way and said there's nothing that can be done. Well, I'll tell you tonight, all of us that are here tonight believe that something can be done. And that starts by talking about it. It starts, it starts by having a chance to meet together, to meet each other, to share ideas, uh, to realize that we, this is a theme, that we are all in this together. And that when we look at our neighbors as, as friends and, and brothers and sisters, it's a better community, isn't it? Um, Peregrine's gonna talk about what it's like to be in a high school today, in a modern high school, and to, to see some of the things that that are going on. There are things that you may hear about on television or read, uh, read about in the paper, but uh, she'll give you some first-hand experience there. And Michael is a fighter. Michael's a guy who, again, has seen these issues, has fought these fights, and who is going to be closing the program for us tonight. After each of them speaks for 12 minutes, then we do we have anybody, by the way, from P Flag, Space Coast Pride, or Rainbow Youth here that is interested in speaking? I know that we've invited speakers. If, if somebody if from any of those groups uh, in, the, in the course of the event tonight would like to speak, we're going to give you a chance uh, after our uh, keynote speakers talk. But after we give each of these folks a chance to talk, I encourage you to be creative. And if you hear somebody else on the panel say something that interests you, feel free to, to chat amongst yourselves because we all learn. Uh, as you speak to us and speak to each other. After each of them spot talks, then, then it's your turn. Each of you will have a chance. We have a microphone in the back. We're gonna take a half an hour for you to do a little question and answers. But until that, let's start the ball rolling with Sue, Sue Kiley, Dr. Sue Kiley, Director of Programs from the Women's Center. Hello. Please. Hi, everyone. I'm going to start talking about what I know best, and that is the Women's Center and the services we provide. I thought I wasn't sure how much people know about us. Uh, some people know a great deal. Some are surprised to hear all of the services. So I'm going to start doing that, and then we'll talk a little more about our event uh, that kind of started this conversation, which I'm very excited to be a part of. Um, I am uh, a licensed mental health counselor, was in private practice for 10 years in Brevard County, um, but the entire time I was doing that, I was also a volunteer for the Women's Center. They didn't have a counseling program back then, so I volunteered and did some support groups and talks and things like that uh, for those 10 years. And then for the past 18, no, 19 years, I've been an employee of the Women's Center 
in various capacities. My title now is Director of Programs, which basically means anything that we do, I oversee. <laughs> any any non-business um, thing that we do, anything that has to do with programs or clients. So I hire and fire the staff, hopefully not too many firings, and uh, supervise and oversee. I do the statistics, I write grants, I do all of that kind of stuff. Um, but my heart first is as a therapist, and so I try to um, primarily oversee the support of my staff who do a tremendous job working with very difficult issues. And that's what I see as my primary job. The Women's Center is a nonprofit agency. We've been in Brevard County for 42 years. Uh, we have a volunteer board of directors, and um, we assist over 10,000 clients annually. Sometimes it creeps up to 12,000, sometimes down to 11, so we generally um, will use that number. Uh, we provide opportunities and services to develop self, safe, healthy, self-sufficient lives. We do like men at the Women's Center and we serve men. We serve people of the LGBTQ community. Um, we are all about providing services to anyone really who needs it. Depending on the program, about 10% to 15% of our clients are men. Um, some programs are for women only, like our transitional safe housing program, things like that. Um, but overall, we work with uh, anyone who walks in the door, generally. Uh, we have offices in Melbourne and in Titusville. Uh, we have a uh, single family safe house in the Melbourne area and we have a domestic violence safe house in Titusville, a shelter in Titusville. Our efforts have basically two overarching social issues that we deal with. Every program is under those two issues. One is poverty and homelessness, the other is interpersonal violence. And everything we do really falls under those two areas. Um, let me throw out some statistics to you. I know we don't like numbers all the time, but in America, a woman is beaten every 15 seconds by an intimate partner. So in the length of time we've been meeting, how many women? For every three victims, two will be women, one will be a male. Among the LGBTQ community, these statistics, I think, change, I think, as well as with heterosexual population, I think these numbers um, reflect an under-reported amount because we know there are many people who don't report. So we'll look at these numbers as we go, but um, what I received from the CDC as far as numbers is that two in five lesbian women and three in five bisexual women experience rape, domestic violence, or stalking by a current or an ex-partner. Every two minutes, someone in America is sexually assaulted. A child, an adult, an elder person, heterosexual, homosexual, every race, every culture, every gender identity, every sexual orientation, and every socioeconomic level, this impacts. So. For teens, it's one in five dating relationships is violence. Is that crazy? Teenagers dealing with violence. So, the other thing I like to make sure I talk about when I talk about interpersonal violence is the misperception that we're talking about anger. And yes, there are certainly perpetrators who are angry folks, and they lose their jobs all the time because they don't like to be told what to do, and they get in bar fights, and they, all of that. But the majority of perpetrators of interpersonal violence don't show that anger and don't do those behaviors except in their home or with their intimate partner. IPV, intimate partner violence, or what we also call power-based violence, occurs because the person has a core belief that it's okay to control somebody else through fear. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's psychological, many times it's economic. Uh, but it's about controlling another person. And the core is not anger, the core is power and control. So, 
Um, we have four programs that serve those two overarching issues of, of poverty and homelessness and interpersonal violence. The first one is our victim services program. Um, in both locations, we have trained victim advocates and a whole network of volunteer victim advocates. In Brevard County alone, every year there's a, a, around 4,000 domestic violence offenses, and those are what are reported to law enforcement. You know there's a whole lot more that are happening that aren't being reported. In Brevard County, last year, seven domestic violence-related fatalities. Seven people were murdered as a result of a domestic violence partner, ex or current partner. Our job, we work with about 3,000 victims a year between our two locations and simply our job is to help pe keep people alive. We, we meet with them, our advocates will meet with them, talk about safety planning, help them understand their rights. Many people come in and don't recognize that it's a crime, you know, that they're getting beat up. Um, so they learn about their legal rights, they learn about, oh boy, I have five minutes of my 12? Holy! <laughs> Okay, so we have a victim services program. We have the SAVS, which is a sexual assault victim services program. We took over the program for the state attorney's office. We now run the rape crisis hotline. We send out SANE nurses in the middle of the night to help with the rape exam, Male, males or females, children 13 or older. Uh, we also have affordable counseling. We run a resiliency group right now in addition to the DV support group the sexual assault support group, incest survivors support group. We're also doing a resiliency support group for children um, and finding that there is a lot of need. There were seven suicides in Brevard County schools last year. Seven teenagers took their lives, most of which stemmed from bullying and harassment that they, they received. And so we started the resiliency groups where we're finding a good turnout. Both We have a teen group, a middle school group, and next month, I believe, we're starting an elementary school group. So, um, very powerful need. Uh, we also provide basic needs for clients, and we have a transitional safe housing program. We own 13 apartments in Brevard County, and we will, oftentimes people go to a shelter, or they're in a homeless program or something, and it's very short term. Shelters are very short term. 45 to 60 days, and only about 25%, 20 to 25% of DV victims go to a shelter anyway. So you need services for people who are fleeing those kinds of situations and need support. So our program is a two-year apartment for somebody for two years where they receive case management and counseling. They're required to do that. I mean, we are in their business and teaching them about life and supporting them to become self-sufficient. We've had people buy their own first-time homes at the end of the two-year program. We've had people get jobs. We have right now somebody who went from a 510, I think was her credit score, to 740, and she just signed on her own condo. You know, she, she's just really come a long way. The program is designed truly to support people to make real changes. There's a need for 14 times more than the 13 apartments we have, but our program really works. Uh, we also have youth programs both in the community and in our schools and a camp in the summer for girls <coughs> to help with self-esteem issues. Um, but So that's the Women's Center. The issue that brought us here, the dude looks like a lady, is tomorrow evening, 6.30. It was changed because of the hurricane. 6.30 to 10 at the Radisson Resort at the port. Please feel free to look up more about it, learn about the dudes on our website. Um, this is the fifth year we've done this event. Um, we have um, had conversations with Gina and Bob about the issues that came up, um, and it is a major fundraiser for us, um, but at the same time, it was never our intent to insult or marginalize anyone. Um, we see it as um, uh, uh, an opportunity to um, provide education to the public. We have about 500 people every year that attend. We raise anywhere from 150000 to $200,000 a year that serve our programs, that serve this community. And um, we 
fully support the LGBT community and full equality rights. We have folks from the LGBT community who are clients. We have folks from that community who are employed by us. We have folks in the community who uh, participate in the event um, and continue to support the event. Um, so we have apologized to anyone who we insulted. We'd love to continue that conversation in a respectful way. We've invited Gina and, and others to come to the event and to give us feedback. After five years, it's time to hear some more feedback about it, and so we're excited. Um, originally, it was an invitation for men to come to represent the woman that they admire. At first, that was sort of the theme. It was actually Wayne Ivey who thought of it, um, Sheriff Ivey, and it was to have men represent a woman who they admire. And so we had Nancy Reagan and Barbara Bush and uh, Oprah and you know all those kinds of things. And, and it, it's transitioned to some people that are just mostly in the entertainment business, um, celebrity women and things like that. But we think that it's an opportunity for men to learn more, for the community to learn more, both about what we do and to support the programs that we provide. So I'm excited to see where the conversation will go tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Conley. Thank you so much for all that you do. It's amazing, isn't it? It's like a time machine. Our next speaker is Bob Gabordi. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to put this in here because you know I'm Italian and I need to use my hands to, when I'm speaking. Um, I, I've written my remarks down because otherwise I'll ramble, um, and you know I'm a writer, so make some sense. I want to introduce just a, a couple people before we get started. First of all, um, w w when Phil was talking, he spoke about the islands and the Keys and um, um, Isidore Rangel, who's um, our public affairs and engagement editor. Stand up, Isidore. First of all, she embedded in the National Hurricane Center in Miami. So the storm was headed right at Miami, and we sent our new employee down to Miami. But, but, but actually, it, was, it may have been the safest place to, to be because it was a, a very safe building. But she no sooner got out of there, we gave her 24 hours, I think, to rest a little bit, and then we sent her to the Keys. And um, she reported from the Keys and, um, followed some evacuees and so on and so forth. Um, so welcome to Brevard. <laughs> um, I also would like to introduce my wife and my daughter, Jessica, who's sleeping. My wife is wide awake. Donna, if you want to wave to everyone. So, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, I told her she was my protection. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so um, in my invitation to be a part of this discussion, I was told that this came about because um, the Space Coast Progressive Alliance accepted my challenge to have additional conversations on LGBTQA rights, and you know we're, we're all here tonight because of that. Um, my challenge was for a community conversation, but honestly, this is not the group that I had in mind. Um, and, and quite honestly, I really hate it when we talk about rights as if one group of people has the right to grant or deny rights to other people, uh, especially in America. And maybe uh, the way that another way of, of looking at that is, you know, we've got to quit thinking that the majority has more rights than the minority. Um, and in, in a column I wrote about this, I said, and I'm quoting myself, which is awkward, um, our, our, our laws ought to protect individuals from discrimination and preserve our freedom to be who we want to be or who we are without consideration of race, gender, ethnicity, um, or place of origin, or whether someone is straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual or transgender. 
So if my house is on fire, and you're a firefighter, I care about one thing, and one thing only. Can you put out the fire? If you're a journalist, and you apply for a job at Florida Today, I'm going to judge you by one thing, and one thing only. Do you have the skills that are needed to get the job done? And if our country is invaded by a hostile enemy, and you're in the military, all I want to know is, can you defend our homeland? As I said in that column, I've never thought it was government's business who adults marry, or sleep with, or how they dress, or what language they speak. Or the business of a neighbor, or a co-worker, or an employer, or any of my business either. I think it's hypocritical and deceitful to say that you believe in freedom and then want to place limits on people, not for their skills or character, but because of who they are or what they look like or whether they are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. Trying to deny civil rights to others does not make you a patriot or a better American, and just the opposite is true, in fact. But the reality suggests that that's where we are in America now, and that's how we still operate. And so that's why I suggested this conversation in the greater community, and why I think it's a great topic for my new group that I'm starting up and involved with in trying to create civil discussions on difficult issues and, um, you know, to, to even debate them. Um, and some people object to that word debate, but I think we need to do that. And I know that so far I've been skirting the issue a little bit and maybe getting ahead of myself because we're not here really today because of the second column that I wrote, but because of the first one that I wrote about the Women's Center do looks like a lady event. So, and by the way, if you, know, if you do come tomorrow night, say that you're coming because of me, because then it'll count towards my total of finances. <laughs> All right, thank you, Gina. I, when I found out that Gina's actually coming, I told her that now I am really nervous. About <laughs> so I agreed to dress, dress as a woman for this event, in particular, Eva Peron, the former first lady of Argentina, who I have long admired. The reason that I've been attracted to Perón is that she reminded me in many ways to the most important mentor that I had in journalism, a woman named Nancy Woodhull, who like Perón, died way too young of cancer after achieving great heights against the odds. I hope to honor Perón's rise from poverty to radio and film actress, to helping to transform her nation's culture and society that caused the Argentinian legislature to award her the title Spiritual Leader of the Nation. And in so doing, honor my friend um, and boss, this memory, Nancy Woodhull. Now all of us have worked long hours trying to do a good job with this event and to pay tribute to the person we're emulating and personifying. Woodhall, by the way, is a member of the National Women's Hall of Fame and rose to be a senior vice president in Gannett and later the Time, the Time Magazine Company without ever graduating from college. I am absolutely certain that she would have chastised me for a paragraph I wrote in that first column. In talking about the dude event, I wrote, quote, again, all we must do is endure one single night of humiliation in the name of fun and entertainment to support the Women's Center, which has as its mission helping women and their children put their lives back together after enduring, after surviving domestic dating and sexual violence. The suggestion that a straight man wearing women's clothing was humiliating offended some people and I apologized for that, and I do so again. It was poorly worded, and I understand why people would take offense. But I don't, take, I don't apologize for taking part in the event. The cause is correct, and even noble, to support the amazing efforts of the Women's Center in helping to create safe, healthy, self-sufficient lives by providing support, education, 
counseling, information, and services. I will tell you that as a child, one of my earliest memories was watching my mother be hurt by a man in her life. And if I can help someone else's mother avoid that horrible scene, I will. I was asked to help, and I said yes. But that's not the only reason that I'm taking part. I think it's a good idea for people to put themselves in other people's shoes once in a while. No, I do not believe as a straight man that this experience is akin to the discrimination a transgender person feels by being forced by social norms into a false reality. But I hope it creates even the tiniest bit of enlightenment. My intent is not to belittle or to discriminate. My intent is to do something good to help people who are working very hard every day to help people like my mother. My colleague, Britt Kennerly, is often my sounding board on issues like this. Here's a little of what she said to me about it. I think what you've done from the beginning was to be honest and open based on your experiences and your values as a journalist. And I think that you've made clear not only would you not intentionally dishonor anyone by your participation, that you're trying to honor all women by shining a light on abuse. And in the process, you've learned, and so hopefully have some in our community, all of us, those on every side of the issue. We have to talk about our differences, highlight them, be made uncomfortable by them, before we can ever hope to find common ground. I think, my reaction, I think the reaction to my column and the event itself have built, it has been partly built on centuries of discrimination and humiliation. I understand the reaction to my column, but I say to you humbly and sincerely, having this conversation with me, who is an ally, only gets us so far. This conversation tonight, I hope, is a start but I thought this comment from another of my journalism colleagues showed the value of the discussion. I think that the criticism this generated was enlightening, at least it was for me. I thought the event seemed antiquated in terms of helping a woman center, but I didn't think about it from the LGBTQ lens until that was brought up. So that was interesting in that it made me think about something that I had totally overlooked and it's always good when that happens. But tonight cannot be the end of the conversation. If we really want to create better and more, morning, more meaningful conversations around these kinds of issues, we have to invite more people into the conversation. People who truly do not agree with us and who have been taught all of their lives to dislike and even hate people who are different than themselves. Will we ever reach them? Probably not completely, so why bother? For two reasons. One is that we'll reach some of them and maybe be able to change some attitudes. And two, these people will be influencers of other people and other generations. Why do we care about that? Because for our country to continue to prosper and be better, we have an obligation to care. Picture that we're in a rowboat trying to paddle our way to a better America and a better future won't we at least have to learn to start talking to each other? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bob. And Gina Lee Duncan. Thank you so much. Good, e good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back in my home county of Brevard. Um, my parents moved to Merritt Island when I was six years old, back in 1964. Um, same house is still there on Marlin Drive up on, on, in River's Edge in Merritt Island. I'm very proud to say that to this day, I still hold the home run record at Merritt Island Little League for hitting the most home run. <laughs> I had the good fortune of being Mr. Merritt Island High School, the homecoming king, um, the captain of Merritt Allen's first undefeated state championship team and an all-state middle linebacker. I received a full scholarship to East Carolina University 
and played football up in East Carolina for Pat Dye, um, and then moved back to Florida after graduating from college with a political science degree. I got into the mortgage banking field, and during that time, I came to work for Wells Fargo, a very progressive, innovative company. Um, a company who's suffered some reputation issues recently, <laughs> but when I joined them was certainly um, known for being super progressive. And accordingly, it was during my 20 years with Wells Fargo that I went to my boss over a stiff martini and told him that it was time for me to be my true self. It was time for me to no longer live this lie and to transition on the job. And I'd done my homework, and I knew that Wells Fargo absolutely walked the walk and talked the talk in reference to, to supporting LGBT people in the workplace. I transitioned, I kept my job as regional manager with the company overseeing a third of the state of Florida, 285 employees, 26 branches up and down the East Coast. I got into advocacy work soon after, left Wells Fargo, left the banking industry right as it blew up, which was good timing. <laughs> And um, I became the, I was elected the LGBT Chamber of Commerce president in Orlando, overseeing the Pride um, events and come out with Pride, which is this weekend, by the way. And discovered a, a, a subculture or community that I didn't even know existed until I transitioned and became involved with this very tight knit, yet very um, oppressed community. And I wanted to jump in there and make a difference. I was elected president of the Chamber of Commerce. As far as I know, I was the first, and I still am the first transgender um, president to serve as a president of a major chamber of commerce in the country. After that, I ran for county commissioner in Orlando, um, got 41% of the vote against a very entrenched incumbent, which was a good showing for a transgender candidate. And then joined Equality Florida. I head up the Transgender Inclusion Initiative for Equality Florida. Our work involves advocacy, education, and public policy work. And, you know, we started this five years ago, and the timing could not have been any better because it was right before this rapidly emerging part of our community started, started to emerge from the shadows. The transgender community reached a point as many cultures or communities within our, our culture of America kind of get to a point of we've had enough. So the community started to step out of the shadows and started to say that we have the right to live our truth and live who we are. We found, however, that people fear what they don't understand. And we knew that there was a lot of education to be done. So we set about educating major employers. That was our first goal. And I had the good fortune and still do to work with hundreds of Fortune 500 companies to provide training for them in transgender cultural competency. How to truly embrace all those policies and procedures that you write, how to actually bridge the gap of when you get that knock on the door and that transgender person wants to take you up on that policy and procedure and be their true selves, as Gina did in transition from Greg, and to truly put your policies in practice. We have seen that our major employers in Florida have been our primary advocates of social justice, LGBT equality, human rights, etc. In our public policy area, this is an area that is often misunderstood, but also is very fraught with gaps and inconsistencies across our state. Many Floridians don't know that you can still be fired from your job simply for being gay or trans. You can get married legally now in the country, come in on Monday, and put your wedding picture on your desk and your employer can fire you for being gay. And that's been unfortunately reinforced by the Trump administration recently as far as um, pushing back on Title VII protections in the workplace. So it's now even more onerous in reference to LGBT people in the workplace. 
Many people don't know also that in the state of Florida does not have a non-discrimination law. We've been working since 2010 to pass what's called the Competitive Workforce Act. And because of the conservative bubble that we have in Tallahassee, we work every session to pass a state non-discrimination law, which would take all of the inconsistencies and ambiguities out of local perceptions of laws and give the state of Florida a consistent and uniform non-discrimination policy. You might know that different counties and cities have fully inclusive human rights ordinances or equal rights ordinances. Brevard does not. Many of you were involved with the very bitter fight to try to pass a human rights ordinance in Palm Bay. That was ugly. It was hateful. It was, there was a lot of mis information and misunderstandings in reference to what was trying to get done. But simply a human rights ordinance does this. It protects certain classes of citizens, including, no, five minutes, including <laughs> <laughs> sexual orientation and gender identity, in that people cannot be fired due to that um, in the areas of housing, employment, or public accommodation. You cannot be discriminated against for being gay or transgender in housing, public accommodations, and housing and employment. In that lens, Dude looks like a lady came to my attention. And I learned a lot from this as well, in the fact that unconscious bias in this whole process of riding back and forth to Bob, I learned a lot as well, because my unconscious bias kicked in immediately because my perception of my home county was that hate-filled, two sessions of five hours worth of bigotry that we had to listen to in Palm Bay of people absolutely just spilling this vile rhetoric towards the LGBT and especially the transgender community. So in that lens, I was looking at Bob saying what he said in reference to hum humiliating himself and the others by number one, you know, I saw this as, as marginalizing the transgender community, but I also saw it impacting women. In that, where is it in the thought process that to dress up like a famous woman that you may, you, you know, you certainly admire, that you see that as something that would humiliate you? And then the whole piece in reference to certainly marginalizing the transgender community, because when people think of transgender people, they think of what? They think of drag queens, right? They think of RuPaul. And people in the transgender community aren't all RuPaul. They're Gina Duncans, who are just out there trying to earn a living, provide for them, their family, be able to use the bathroom that aligns with their gender identity, and to be able to live and have our own piece of the American dream. The good news is that we met with the Women's Center and I was very pleased that, that um, Speak Out Brevard, as well as Space Coast Pride, was also there. And we learned a lot from each other. That civil discourse that was initiated from Bob's comments, it all came down to this event is for a good cause, this event is well done. While, you know, it's somewhat dated in reference to drag, the benefits outweigh the negatives of this. And we knew that it was all, we came to the conclusion that it was all in the execution. It's not the event, it's not the cause, it was perhaps just the wording in reference to that. The second piece of this, which I find that I think is very important, is that we can work together to provide a moment of education. In that how can we move Brevard forward? And this can be another one of those moments. So we'll have a table at the event. We will have information about what it means to be transgender. And you know, besides being a wonderful event, which raises a lot of money for a good cause, we'll also be able to educate people as far as what it means to be transgender. And someday down the road, with all of our 
you know, cooperation amongst all our groups and people that believe that social justice and equal rights for everyone should be in Brevard County, and it sh Brevard County should have a human rights ordinance. This will be another step in getting there. Thank you. <clears throat> so much, Gina, and uh, Peregrine Hayward. Firstly, I just want to say thank you so, so much to Gina for everything she has done, because I know that it has done so much. The work that she's done, the work that people in her organizations have done, has done so much for the lives of myself and my peers who are LGBTQ as well. There is no question that through the incredible work of the generations before us, through their unfaltering bravery and strength, standing against prejudice, threats, and even violence and death, today's young, young members of the LGBTQ community are afforded a far easier and more open existence. We can find overall acceptance and unconcerned kindness. That does not mean, however, that there is nothing left to improve, that there are no more struggles faced by LGBTQ members of the community today. No more to be done to be better for the to better the world for those who come after us. Rather, this is all the more reason to continue striving for progress, seeking an ideal world that may very well be unattainable, but should always be fought for. Middle and high school is an intrinsically tra transitory and often difficult time for young adults. It is a time when we become painfully aware of the differences that separate us from our peers that can make it far too easy to feel set apart, to feel as though we cannot fit in or be accepted. These outstanding portions of ourselves can be especially alienating for members of the LGBTQ plus community. It is also in the upper grades of school when adolescent lack of empathy combines with a desire to fit in, a search for status, for acceptance, to form the everyday prejudices, casually presented and potentially unthought of, that are so prevalent in schools across the country. The use of gay and other harsher, harsher slurs as insults synonymous with stupid or lame or weak coexist alongside the weightier cruelties, the specifically aimed barbs and willfully cutting remarks to make being an LGBTQ plus youth often feel like an exercise in disappointment, loneliness, and even misplaced self-hatred. LGBTQ plus clubs are such an incredibly important resource for schools to provide and, when run correctly, can help not only to foster meaningful discussions on current events and how they affect the LGBTQ plus community, advancements and setbacks, but also be a powerful force for betterment and reassurance in the lives of those who attend. They can provide community reassurance and greatly help to alleviate the feeling of isolation many LGBTQ plus youth have. However, it is possible for these clubs to be run in an unhelpful way or even a detrimental fashion. When I first moved to Satellite Beach my, so my junior year of high school, I was thrilled to find out that there was a LGBT, an established LGBTQ plus club at the school where I'd moved from in Virginia. Ours had only been running for one year after the previous administration had left and we were finally allowed to start one. Going to the club here, however, it was a vastly different experience from the one I'd been to and had been the president of at my old school. I remember I'd gone the day of Club Rush, which is when there are tables set up during lunchtime for all the different clubs and you can sign up to get information on them and talk to representatives. That day, at, during club time, we went and discussed and the teacher asked how, how Club Rush had been, how running the table had been, and the students said that, the students in running the table said that there had been people leaving fake names and being overall somewhat rude. And then the teacher asked, how does that make you feel? And they were like, unhappy, of course, because it is reasonable to be unhappy when you feel discriminated against. But then the teacher didn't continue to say anything about, well, let's talk about why the actions of these individuals do not have the power to make us feel less good about ourselves or have the power to make us feel somehow inherently as though we are the problems. Rather, we just talked that day and every day attended the club about times we'd felt persecuted and times we'd felt discriminated against. But we never talked about times we felt accepted. We never talked about 
times where those we told we were gay or told we were transgender or, or told we were bisexual or anything accepted us and welcomed us. We did not look at positive representation in the media or positive changes in laws, only negative ones. And it felt as though that club was almost an echo chamber reflecting back all of the sorrow and all of the frustration that can be felt so easily by students. My point is that often clubs have to be run in such a way that we do look at the problems that are faced and we do listen to the to like the troubles people have been experiencing but also that we look at the hope and also that we look forward towards the future and talk about how to better a future and how even now there is so much acceptance but of course it can be made to be better but it's not dark only and then in contrast the rainbow youth of brevard which is in melbourne was an incredible experience we discussed positive things in the lgbtq plus community we discussed things that were going on that were beneficial and we did discuss problems we'd faced we discussed experiences we would had that were difficult but we talked about why the actions of those people who would the, the cruelties they had said and the statements they'd made that were not kind and were not needful, why those did not have necessarily the power to hurt us. It is so important for all of us, youth and adults, LGBTQ+, and non-LGBTQ+, alike, to remember that, in the words of Eleanor Roosevelt, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. It is important for all of us to remember that those who are cruel do so out of smallness, as their needless judgment seeks only to lower us to the level which they already exist. And of course, it is not so simple as saying, I will not let this bother me. Because prejudice, judgment, unfounded cruelty, they hurt. It's staggering and unexpected and bitter when they occur. It's hard to respond to and harder to forget. For all that I speak of standing firm and unbothered, I can easily recall a time when I was talking to a classmate who I greatly respected, and she casually mentioned how much she hated seeing the gay people kissing in the hallways. I would love to say that with affronted dignity and graceful poise, I looked at her and said, I'm gay, you know, but I didn't. Instead, I think I muttered something about not liking to see anyone kiss in the hallways and never spoke to her again. This was such a minor comment, not even directed at me specifically, but three years later, and I still remember it, thinking about how I should have responded and feeling unhappy or as though I somehow failed in that regards. It's hard to respond to prejudices and insults, whether it is someone making a comment directed at you or referring to a difficult test as gay. There's an immediate feeling of frustration and ridiculous as it may be, shame. There is this sense that we should know how to respond, not only to condemn their words of bigotry, be they minor or major, but to posi positively affect their thinking, as if we should be able to completely revitalize their worldview and convince them to change their ways. It feels as if the burden of not only outrage, but mediation and persuasion falls to us, and it's a burden that we cannot possibly fulfill on our own. But that does not mean that we cannot respond and that it cannot be fulfilled. The fact that there are members of our community out here tonight all of you listening and learning about what they can do to help is so incredibly important and powerful. The fact that there are people like Bob and like Gina who are willing to talk and to come to an understanding and a realization of things they have done that might not have been necessarily thoughtful is so important and it underscores the fact that the world is overall a good place and overall this country is improving and overall what we can the lesson we can take from this is to always be kind, to always be there for those who need you, and to always speak out for those in your community, if you can, and if they cannot speak out for themselves. Thank you all so much for being here tonight and support. Thank you so much, Corbin. Isn't that that's the voice of a future community leader yes. I've ever heard it. Thank you, Parker, and that was beautiful. And as I said, last but not least, Michael Bloom. Good evening. Good evening. Can you turn it off?
How about now? Yeah, here we go. Okay. I'm not touching. How's this? Better? All right. So one of one of the pitfalls of going last is that you may find that the other people have said many of the same things that you've said. So if I repeat something that one of the other people up here said, think of it this way. If two or more of us said it, it must be important. So It was just about 10 years ago, as a new resident of Brevard, I wandered into one of its many festivals. That day, I signed some petitions, I ate some hummus, and I became an activist. That day was just one VW bus short of the summer of love. <laughs> it was Progressive Fest. So tonight, it is with great pride that I'm, I, I'm here speaking at a Space Coast Progressive Alliance event. For over 20 years, I've been speaking, raising awareness for the LGBTQ community. One of the questions that I'm always asked is, what is the hardest part about being gay? I'd like you to make a list in your head. In your head, list the three people that are most important to you. List the three places that are most important to you. List the three things that you enjoy doing. And list three things that you discuss with your close friends. So now it's Monday morning, and you're on your way into work, and a coworker falls in beside you and asks, what did you do this weekend? And before you answer, there's one important rule. You can't mention any one of the things on your list. <laughs> That, for me, is the hardest part about being gay. It's the constant need to make that split-second decision, how much of myself is it safe for me to be in this moment? For many people in the LGBTQ community, they must make that decision many times a day. Yesterday was National Coming Out Day. Anybody need the mic for a minute? <laughs> uh, another question that I'm always asked was, when you came out, was it difficult? How did you come out? What reaction did you get? There is no one-size-fits-all answer for any of us, and coming out is not a one-time event for any of us as well. It's something we all do daily, and sometimes many times a day. Again, the questions. Who should you come out to? When should you come out? How should you come out? It's, again, it's that split-second decision. How out, is, how out is it safe for me to be in this moment? For those of you who don't know me, I work for Brevard County Fire Rescue. Yes, Bob, I can put out the fire in your house. <laughs> and I can figure out how it started after we put it out. <laughs> Uh, I'm a plans examiner and a fire investigator, and I work out of the government center in Vieira. Recently, a close friend got a promotion and now works across the street at the school board. Last week, we had lunch in the cafeteria at the school board, and after lunch, he walked me out to the lo lobby. Normally, our goodbyes include a hug, but then there was an awkward pause as we both hesitated. We hesitated to ask that question. Was it safe for him to be seen hugging another man in public? Was it safe for me, in my uniform, to be seen hug hugging another man in public? We both hesitated for a moment until we remembered that we were among those who fought and won last year for the right for us to hug each other goodbye without hesitating. But yet, we hesitated. As an activist for the LGBTQ community, I have a passion to speak out. Do I speak out? When do I speak out? How do I speak out? Once again, I find myself asking, is it safe for me to speak out in this moment? The world defaults to straight. 
And people who do not identify as LGBTQ do not have to make that decision. They don't have to hesitate to look at where they are, at who is around, and decide if it's safe to hug, to hold a hand, to kiss, to use a term of endearment, or refer to someone as their boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. These are the everyday little prejudices that often go unnoticed by all of us as they're happening to others around of us and even to ourselves. We all know the obvious pre prejudices. You only need to look as far as the comments in response to last year's proposals for a human rights ordinance in the city of Palm Bay and the enumeration of the LGBTQ students and staff in the Brevard County School policies. These are just two public examples of the rhetoric and the anger and the grandstanding and the hate and the humiliation that many of the LGBT community face not only in public, but at school, at work, in our military, from the churches we were raised in, and sadly for many of us, our own families. And even when it's unintentional, it still stings. In recent years, many battles have been won for the LGBTQ rights nationally, at a state level, and locally. Currently in Florida, we now have a patchwork of protections. Using myself as an example, my union national includes sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression in its non-discrimination policy. My local union follows the county policy. The county policy follows the state policy, which includes none of them. Brevard County Fire Rescue Policy includes only sexual orientation. I don't even have a patchwork, it's more of an eye patch. You know? So when I'm at work, is it safe for me to take a P-flat coffee mug to work? Is it safe to have a rainbow sticker on my car? When I'm at home, do I need to degay my apartment before the landlord comes to fix something? More questions. But it's not without hope. We have been making progress in Brevard. There are now LGBTQ services and support groups where once there were none. We have PFLAG, we have Brevard Transgender Network, Rainbow Youth, several open and affirming churches, our newest link of Brevard, and the list grows almost daily. Space Coast Pride recently celebrated 10 years, three of which have taken place in the EGAD Arts District. From a picnic in the park, it's grown to a, from an afternoon to a full day, to a weekend, to a week of events with thousands of participants. Three years ago, as part of Space Coast Pride, Brevard County had its first ever gay pride parade. I first carried the American flag in a parade as a Cub Scout. Over the years, I've carried the flag in parades as part of many groups, most recently as a member of the Brevard County Rescue's Honor Guard. I proudly carry the American flag for my LGBTQ community and our pride parade. The influx of text jobs have brought many new diverse families to our community. These families have become vital members of both the LGBTQ community and the community at large. Local charitable organizations are actively recruiting the LGBTQ community for board members, for employees, for volunteers. They have all come to realize that the LGBTQ community is overrepresented in the at-risk populations they serve. Last year, Brevard County Schools enumerated the LGBTQ students and the staff in school policy. This is now the largest population in Brevard County with protection. It's close to 80,000 people, which translates to nearly 20% of the county. And a large part of this is happening and due to the support of the many allies, a lot of them in this room, that joined with the LGBT community, Equality Florida, Brevard National Organization of Women, and the Space Coast Progressive Alliance. So how do we move forward? By maintaining the progress we've made and supporting the resources and organizations that are working with the community, motivating more of the LGBTQ community to get involved, building new alliances both inside and outside of our community, but most importantly by sharing our personal stories. It's when we can change those stereotypes and become human 
that we change people's hearts and minds. My hope is that for each person that I come out to as gay, that then when they hear the word, word gay, instead of stinking, thinking of the stereotypes, they will think of me. And they will no longer say, this doesn't affect me, I don't know anyone who's gay. And they will stand up and speak out. The challenge was to start a discussion, and tonight we are here talking the talk. My challenge to everyone in this room, whether you identify as a member of the LGBTQ community or as an ally, when you find yourself asking that question, should I speak up, will you use your voice to continue to talk the talk? Will you join us as we continue to walk the walk towards equality for all? Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I'll tell you what, how, what are those fantastic presentations? Oh, I have to say. Yeah, how about a round of applause for you? One more time, please. I'm very proud to be here tonight, guys. This is really cool. Hey, I'm just curious, one last time I'm going to ask, is there anybody from Beat Flag, Space Coast Pride, Rainbow Youth, that would like to take a minute or two to talk? Well, uh, if not, then actually, uh, let me, let me uh, open the floor. We have a microphone right there. If anybody would like to speak, please uh, go ahead and take the mic, uh, introduce yourself. And, and this is a chance to ask a question, not necessarily to uh, uh, you know, reinvent the wheel. But if, if anybody, did, did you say you might like to talk? No? Uh, sure. Yes. If you want to, sure. take a couple minutes. Please identify yourself and then go ahead and take the mic. Here, you take this one. Yeah. Hello, I'm Lotus Lindis. Wasn't preparing to speak today. Three minutes. Okay. Um, so I uh, run a small group called Project, uh, Project Nebula. And I'm also um, working with the LGBT++ meetup groups. Um, so the Project Nebula is um, a project started a year and a few months ago by a few friends and I to have a support slash social group for some of uh, uh, LGBT folk in Brevard County. Uh, we meet every other Wednesday for Q Club, which is like our support group session, and every other Thursday for our social like fun time. Um, and then I'm also uh, acting president of the Harris Corporation um, Employee Resource Group for LGBT um, employees. And um, I basically want to um, came here today um, knowing that this um, was a very important topic for the community. Um, nothing I say, disclaimer, nothing I say is on behalf of Harris Corporation. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but um, I personally do want to make um, a lot of you talk about employment and um, one of, to me, um, I'm, I'm a UX engineer, um, but I feel like um, even, even if you're not directly a community organizer, if you're, not, if you're not directly a politician, you and your everyday jobs can make a change um, in the place that you work. Um, you, uh, even if, it, if you work at Macy's and you're a cashier, you have the power to do anything that you want to affect your workplace for the better, and um, that's what um, I would like to do in, in my position as well, um, to make sure that I, throughout my whole life, like um, just uh, personal experiences, stories I've heard, after a while, you're kind of done with you're kind of done with any kind of prejudice. You just can't handle it anymore. Um, you you just don't want. You feel like it should. This should be all well and over over fifty thousand years ago, um, but it's not. Um, so I try to um, in my everyday life do some small changes to affect the LGBT community for the better. Um, so the only thing I, I guess I want to say is. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on, um, I want to make, again, not on behalf of Harris Corporation, I want to make a Harris Corporation an LGBT friendly workplace. It is a major um, employment provider for Brevard County, um, and so that is my personal mission. Um, I don't want to hear any more stories about um, people coming, um, 
saying that they're having problems transitioning at work. Um, I want to, I, I, I'm done. With, I'm done with the bad stories. I'm just, I'm ready to move. I want to hear good stories. So, um, 30 seconds. So, the only thing I want to say to you today um, is that you don't have to be a, you don't necessarily be a community organizer. You don't have to be a politician. You can just, you can be a, a writer or um, a teacher or a nurse, any kind of job, you have uh, the power within your daily life to make a change. And so that's all I want to do. Thank you so much, Lotus. We appreciate that. It's cool. Say again? Hey, you know what? That is an interesting point. You know, I was saying earlier that we were always looking for an action item. That's probably too easy to say an action item is, you know, hey, to, to you know, walk a mile of the other person's moccasins. And when you can reach out to help someone, do it. Do it. Don't be afraid. Easier said than done, huh? I don't know. Yes? I, well, actually, if you would like to take the mic, we've got, you can put you right in line. How about that? Laura, you have the mic. Okay. Is that Who are you? You're good. You're good. Who am I? No. Uh, Alan, have you ever seen me with a mic that I wouldn't introduce myself? I'm Laura Pasone. I'm Vice President of Florida Now, National Organization for Women. And I want to say this is the one of the most outstanding panels I have ever seen. Um, so thank you all. And I'm sorry I wrote that nasty letter, Bob, about <laughs> startled with fiddle dee dee. I'm sorry. Anyway, that's not why I'm talking. Um, I do have an action. You know, we've talked about human rights ordinances, and you were talking about uh, things that you were going to do with that. You know, there's a piece of legislation that's been around for 40 some years, and every year comes up again in the Florida legislature. It's called the Equal Rights Amendment, and it covers zip zam boom everybody in this room because it just says basically 16 words that say you can't discriminate against sex. It has been passed. It was passed back in like 72, and it requires two thirds of the states to ratify. We need three more states. Florida can be one of those states. Senator Florida Senator Lori Berman every year sponsors it. We have Thad Altman, we have Randy Fine, we have Mayfield, we have Zim Zam, the rest of them here. Why not everybody take an action to write a letter, call your state legislator, your state senator, and say, this year I want it. And you know what? I'm wondering if maybe the executive editor at Florida Today would write. <laughs> I'm just wondering, does anybody know who this person is? And maybe he could spearhead it. Because you know what? Why are we doing this if we're not going to get legislation passed? That, I think, is the fastest and easiest legislation to get passed. And then I will be there in Tallahassee to break the glass and take that stupid plaque down that where they brag about the fact that they defeated it back in 72. I want to be the person to smash that glass, so how about everybody do that so I can do that? <laughs> so that's what that does is that we the question to the table. Um, who would like to take it for, it looks like Bob's ready to go. Yeah, uh, first of all, or I said this to you privately, I want to say it publicly, I'm not sorry you wrote that letter at all, because <laughs> that's what this is, you know, there has to be that. So, and besides the executive editor of Florida Today, the chief of, of our opinion page is, is, uh, is Adora. So, uh, uh, I'll get you so, on board. Too. So, you, you got two of the votes of, on the editorial page already, on the editorial already. But I, I really do think that, you know, um, all kidding aside, that Phil, you made the suggestion earlier too that um, in addition to the, the print people that get the, the, see the letters to the editor, that it's really important that um, people do challenge when they disagree with, with things that they see, not just by us, um, but 
from each other and that we try to foster a really strong community conversation on an ongoing basis. It was just a brief apology. Yeah. I got over it. Okay. <laughs> but, but keep writing. Just okay. be nicer. <laughs> Gene, I think you wanted to add something. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in in that I might have to push back against that in reference to we, every year, keep moving closer in getting the Competitive Workforce Act passed in Tallahassee. And it truly is almost a generational thing. We see every new legislator like Anna Eskamani that goes to Tallahassee, they are progressive young people who are passionate about social justice and equal rights. And those are the kind of people we need, to, we need to keep funneling into the political system to represent our progressive I'm not saying one agenda. instead of the other, but let's, right. you know. Well, you know, we've, uh, I've adopted this adage recently, when they go low, we go local. <laughs> because that's some things that we can control. Our school boards, county commissioners, city council people. We can vote the wrong people out and we can vote the right people in and that will bleed up to Tallahassee as a grassroots effort, and we'll get this done. So, you know, there's different ways to skin the cat, but um, we, we kind of think at this point a, a local push is, and there's so many people that are now in, engaged in social justice. You think of all of the marginalized communities within our society who are now mobilized. You know, we've got the Muslim community, we've got women, We've got the LGBTQ community whose hair's on fire of all the stuff that the Department of Justice is doing. Um, the people of color. All of, you know, if this coalition of progressives, of people who are being marginalized and othered in today's political climate could come together to push for social justice and candidates that support that, we can make a difference. Well, I'd like to see like a website or some literature on it, because actually, and, and I think I'm pretty well politically connected, but today's the first day I've ever heard about that one, so um, I, I'd love to share it. You where know, where can we find, it. where can yeah. the audience go to find good information? In reference to the, the, uh, the Competitive Workforce Act? Yeah. You can just Google it, it'll come up, because every year we're, we're working on it. Okay. And just recently has it received enough bipartisan support to actually get in front of the committee. Gina, could I ask you to do us a favor, and yes. that would be, if you have anything, you know, like a nice little article about that, could you send it to us at the okay. SCPA, and we'll put it on our website? That doesn't. So. Thank you. I definitely will. And also, Planned Parenthood yep. is advocating for passage of that. Well. Yes. You know, I often think of, you know, it's almost like we have the nucleus for a new political party. You know, the Human Rights Party or whatever. When you think of all of the groups that I just talked about, that's a lot of people. And, you know, and currently, you know, the engagement of women in what's going on in, in today's political climate, that's a huge voting bloc. That's a huge force for good. You know what's interesting, uh, and I can speak to our local DEC. It has made a transition it's recently that's been amazing, and it's become the Human Rights Party. It's pretty interesting. If you haven't been to a DEC meeting, uh, we're nonpartisan, and we don't endorse candidates and all that kind of stuff, but I tell you what, it's pretty pretty interesting uh, to see what's happened. I, I encourage you to, to uh, seek that out. I've always said, you've always heard me say this, folks, and that is, all politics is local, right? Take, take a good look around. We're coming, we actually have an election. This is an election year, believe it or not. There are municipal elections. Look at the candidates that are out there in your community. There's some municipal candidates, a couple, uh, I think, county-wide uh, things. Um, find a candidate that you like. Help them out, whether we're you know, knocking on doors, throw them a couple bucks. Uh, it makes a difference, it really does. Some of these issues, uh, you, you know, uh, being able to call your congressman, call your senator, call your lo uh, local legislator, and let them know that you're watching. Let them know that you're watching. And I'll tell you what, it's extremely powerful. Anybody else want to field uh, anything else for that question, or we're going to go to the next question? Next question, sir. Patience, <laughs> patience, young man. The virtue. My name is Greg, and the thing about discrimination, which I witnessed, uh, in an organization which had all a federal agency about uh, 
no discrimination. One thing that happens, it's, it's old terms from the civil rights era, we forgot about this, there's de facto discrimination and there's de jure. We can fight the de jure with the laws, but de facto is another thing entirely. I'll give you an example. I, I saw this happen. This female was applying for a job and it's an executive position. And the male who was the, the um, selecting officer said, I will not hire a woman for that job. Very stupid man because select, see, see there's, you get on the best qualified list, which is open to protests and discrimination and, and grievance suits and all that. But the selection process happens over the phone. The guy in this office talks to the guy, your supervisor in that office, and the tone of voice may decide whether you get selected or not. That's the one that's hard to... Now, this man was quite stupid, actually. He should have never said that. And not only that, he said in front of somebody who was willing to testify. And she got the job. But I can tell you, that happens like once in several blue moons. <laughs> and I know you have a question for these guys, and that is? I'm at quest, well, I think you need to have a two tired policy, uh, strategy. You have the de facto that you can fight for in the register. The jury, sorry. The jury, you can fight with the law. And that helps, we can get a lawyer to do that. But we need to think about how do you, how do you work with de facto discrimination? Michael, this sounds like it might be a question for you um, in your field. Much better. Um, I think that's where we use our personal stories and we change the hearts and minds of people. Um, it's very difficult for someone to discriminate against someone that they know well. Um, it's very easy to, to look at a name or look at a picture or, or meet someone once and, and make a decision about it. It's a, it's a uh, you know, basic human instinct. In 10 seconds, you decide whether someone that's approaching you is a threat or not. We decide a lot of other things in 10 seconds as well. Um, so it's, it's getting to know people, it's getting, uh, you know, getting that deeper connection, um, and it's people that are willing to, to put themselves out there as a member of the LGBTQ community or, or as an ally. When they hear someone or they see someone do something that they know is wrong, be willing to, to speak up and speak out and say, hey, that's not right. And eventually, the people that you can change, you will change, and the people that you can't change will die out. <laughs> anybody, else want to, anybody else want to pick this one up? No, well, could I just make a comment? Pure, you got it. Because I didn't get to finish this one point, and I wanted to just put this out there. You got the mic, The first bank, Bob, for creating this. Yes, and, and civil discourse is so powerful. But I wanted to tell Bob an interesting paradigm that I experienced and um, talking about you know unconscious bias is when all this stuff started flying within my community and even within Equality Florida, I had my team emailing me saying, I'm gonna be doing drag next week at our Pride event. What's the difference between what you're pushing back against for the Women's Center and what we're doing to raise money for come out with pride in Orlando. Interesting. And we, and I throw this out for discussion or thoughts, but we settled on intent. Almost in the fact that gay drag, drag performers are revered, right? They're given money. It's just, oh my God, you're amazing, you're beautiful, you just, you look just like Eva Perón which you will tomorrow. <laughs> and then, you know, versus perhaps this, this dated dude looks like a lady that, event that, that maybe comes from a different place, you know? 
because again we were framing it in humiliation I know that's changed but just that nuance and that that the perception is 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 so slight in reference to well, what's the difference and why would you push back against one and the other is part of our culture as an LGBTQ community so let, let me speak to that just a little bit and um, and, and thank you for bringing that up because that is exactly my answer too. Um, someone, um, you know, someone sent me an email saying, "How is what you're doing different than um, some of the old-time entertainers doing blackface?" And um, because you know, pretending to be someone that you're not. And my response was exactly that, is that intent, that, that we have to look at that. And what, what is the intent in, in doing this? Um, and I, I, I can promise you that I have tried to be careful about how I portray Eva Patron, uh, Perone. Unfortunately, I think I'm going to look more like like her grandmother. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I, you know, I, it, I, I, some of my humiliation when I first used that word, um, and again, I did a horrible job in explaining that, but me getting up on a stage, singing and dancing, um, wait till you hear me. <laughs> and wait, wait till you see me. Well, it is Halloween, you know, Halloween yeah. Horror Night kind of experience, right? <laughs> and and I, I've I've done I you know for three different times uh, when I when I was in uh, Tallahassee, I was invited twice to do um, a singing and dancing thing, a celebrity kind of singing and dancing thing. It wasn't dressing up as anyone, but. The cause was so strong that I was motivated to do it, but I'm scared to death of, of that situation. I, I can speak in front of, you know, a hundred thousand people, but put me up on stage to sing and dance, you know, we'll see how tomorrow goes, but that, that was part of what I was trying to say. It wasn't just the dress part that scares me. Thank you very much. Our next question. Hi, I'm Linda, and I think I have a question for you, Michael. My son is an adult transgender, and he's received quite a bit of bullying during his life. Um, it's very painful for the parents, very painful for the grandparents. And I think people need to remember there's like several major hate groups out there that work behind the scenes that we're not really aware of. Like, uh, the one that got all the legislation passed for the bathroom bills. It was the same group in every single state that adopted them, wrote this. They had it blank, like a, a preset saying. Family Council. Yeah. Family, Family Council. Council. And so Liberty Council here Liberty Council in invaded our Brevard schools. They retreated.